Hello, and thank you for listening to the Plasma for Life podcast series brought to you by RFN Studios. If you'd like to learn more, visit www.plasmaforlife.org and follow our social media. Account links can be found on our website. My name is Kate. I am a Canadian multifocal motor neuropathy patient who was affected by the subcutaneous immunoglobulin shortage. This experience, along with the experience of other patients, made me dig deep into the world of Canada's plasma supply and inspired me to do whatever I could to raise awareness and advocate for change. This journey led me to today's guest, Peter Jaworski. He is a Canadian ethicist, associate teaching professor of business ethics at Georgetown University, author of Markets Without Limits, Moral Virtues and Commercial Interests, co-founder of DonationEthics.com, and co-founder of Plasma for Life. He has been a great supporter, advocate, and partner And here's what he had to say on the current status of Canada's plasma supply chain. I think the most important thing to understand is that Canada is almost entirely reliant on plasma from other countries for the uh, for the plasma medicines uh, that people like you need uh, either to just live like sometimes the medicines are literally life saving. Uh, In other cases, they make a very significant improvement to the quality of life. So we are, as a country, we are almost entirely dependent on other countries. It used to be the case that like overwhelmingly over 80% of the plasma medicine that we use in Canada came from paid donors in the United States. Canadian Blood Services has now started to diversify a little bit and they also uh, take um, plasma medicine that is made with European but also paid plasma. So Canada is in this weird situation where the provinces that are the most populous, I mean, Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia, over 80% of Canada's citizens reside uh, resides in one of those provinces. Um, and each of those provinces have banned paying, uh, paying donors for plasma donations in those provinces. And yet over 80% of the plasma medicine that Canadians use comes from uh, foreign sources, comes from countries that pay their own donors. That's the present and I think totally unsustainable situation in Canada. Canadian Blood Services, who is responsible for managing Canada's blood and plasma supply, surely they must be working to fix this issue. Canadian Blood Services does have a plan to increase domestic reliance or, or self-sufficiency. You know, my opinion is those are, are first of all, they're, they're at least two to four times more expensive than, than paying people for their plasma. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just don't think it's going to work. So Canada's in, a, I, I think, a bit of a precarious situation looking forward into the future. As the other element of this is the growth rate in the use of the plasma medicines. Which, which is awfully close to 10% growth uh, around the world. So we need a lot more plasma and Canada is just not contributing. In fact, Canadian Blood Services aims to open 40 plasma collection centers across the country, asking for $855 million of government funding. This project aims to achieve 50% self-sufficiency in a time where Canada and the world needs more plasma. According to the World Health Organization, there are about 1.4 million people living with primary immunodeficiency, and 75% of them do not have adequate access to plasma therapies. During last year's shortage, I heard stories from other patients in the U.S. suffering even worse than Canadians did being forced to stretch out their treatments by an extra two to four weeks, 
or some not knowing if they'd get their treatment month to month at all. Now, with the prospect of convalescent plasma and hyperimmune globulin to possibly treat COVID-19 and the drop in usual donations seen because of the pandemic, we are adding stress to an already strained supply. And Canadian Blood Services is anticipating yet another potential shortage in late 2020 to early 2021. Patients are suffering from our apathy, and Canada needs to stand up and set the example. Peter feels the same. If, if we're going to ban commercial enterprises from collecting plasma and Canadian Blood Services is the only collector of plasma, I think that's frankly disappointing. Canada is a rich country, right? We are, we are amongst the richest. I say we because I am Canadian, right? But like mm-hmm. we are amongst the richest countries in the world. The demand for plasma medicine is global. It's not just Canadian. I have no idea why we're so narrow-minded. And I'll say that, you know, I say that with some advisement and a bit of care, but like I feel as though we're being so narrow-minded. Canada needs to be a net exporter of plasma. That is, we shouldn't be aiming for 50% self-sufficiency. We should be main, uh, aiming for collecting 200% of Canada's needs so that we can... Uh, so that we can export the plasma to poorer countries around the world that are still in need, in desperate need of of the plasma to manufacture this medicine. So what do I think of Canadian Blood Services aiming for 50% self-sufficiency? I think that's just not good enough. Peter has been an advocate for the need to pay plasma donors to give patients reliable access for years. As an ethicist, he has summed up the focus of the argument with the acronym SSACE. Safety is the first and most important um, reason. The second one is security and then ACE, altruism, commodification, and exploitation. Those are like the five major objections. Well, let's go through the most important ones. The, The issue of safety was in every province where they have gone ahead and passed the law, which is the Voluntary Blood Donations Act. The people on the other side, the people who oppose it, have raised the specter of like, it's possible that we might have another tainted blood scandal. Uh, It's possible that there are um, diseases or viruses that we don't yet know about that might appear in our blood supply or in the uh, compensated plasma. So they raised the issue of safety. And I actually think, not only do I think that that's wrong because it flies in the face of what every expert has to say, it's also... I mean, it has to be wrong because nobody has yet argued for a ban on the importation of plasma medicine made with paid plasma. The people who are against paid plasma in Ontario or in Alberta or in other provinces in Canada, none of them have said that we should ban the importation of this of this plasma medicine made with paid plasma. Not only do I think that it's wrong, I actually think that it's irresponsible on the part of the other side to even suggest it because it, it's contrary to expert consensus. It's, it's contrary to like the medical uh, community's views on the matter. I think it raises worries in the minds of people who like yourself are reliant on plasma medicine. So I think it's an irresponsible objection uh, to paid plasma. Uh, Graham Sure, the CEO of Canadian Blood Services, there's a YouTube video of him explaining, and that's the language that he uses, by the way. He says that paid plasma is just as safe, like equally safe as unpaid plasma for the manufacture of these medicines. The U.S. plasma centers, they operate really well. They operate in a highly regulated environment. People don't understand, but if you want to export, if I'm, if I'm a U.S. paid plasma center and I want to make plasma medicine for export into the Canadian uh, market, I'm not only regulated by the FDA here in the United States, but I also have to pass regulatory approval by Health Canada. And the same is true if I want to export to the European market, uh, my center has to be regulatorily approved, not just by the FDA, but also by the, I think it's the European Medicines Authority there. So many of these centers are regulated by the FDA, by Health Canada, and by the European Medicines Alliance. simultaneously. And in addition, all of the commercial paid plasma centers in the United States that export to Canada are members of the Plasma Protein Therapeutics Association. 
and so they participate in this it's not required by law but they all participate in it they participate in the international quality plasma program um, uh, certification system which introduces additional regulatory hurdles every medical expert it, every medical expert has said that like paid plasma is just as safe as unpaid plasma for the manufacture of these plasma medicines. The security question is a question about having enough. And I, there's no country in the world that is that collects enough plasma unless they pay people. With respect to security, we know that incentivizing people, we know that paying people to donate plasma is going to increase the amount of plasma that people donate. So the security issue is also like it, it counts in favor of paying people for plasma. In fact, according to a Health Canada study, almost 90 percent of the global supply comes from the commercial sector who pays donors. But since plasma is part of blood, we need to ensure that patients also have reliable access to whole blood when they need it and examine the relationship between plasma collection and whole blood collection. The Health Canada expert panel report said, you know, they looked at some of the evidence and they didn't see um, any signs of a negative impact um, on unpaid blood donations from the presence of paid plasma in a jurisdiction. Um, and all of the studies that I've looked at so far are all of them survey based or they're kind of you know, let's look at Germany and what happened in Germany before and after they had paid plasma, which is not, which is not the same as looking at like specific jurisdictions and doing the math. And all of those studies point in both directions. We don't really know, but my colleague and I, so Bill English and I, we've we've looked at um, three cities in Canada that saw the introduction of paid plasma and they had unpaid blood, they had Canadian blood services, you know, blood centers there. Uh, we looked at those jurisdictions. We also matched those up with three cities in the United States that also had that same dynamic. And that not only did we not see a negative effect on unpaid blood donations, we saw a very small but consistent across all six jurisdictions that we looked at, we saw a consistently tiny positive effect on unpaid blood donations. But I actually think that what's driving it is that there are different populations. So the appeal of paid plasma appeals to people who are different from the people who find donating blood appealing. I think it's something like less than 3% of Canada's population donates blood. About, you know, about 15% of Canadians report that they've donated blood in the past, but only about 3% of Canadians and Americans have actually donated blood right and, and it's actually possible that advertising for paid plasma you know people who are not interested in selling their plasma might see an advertisement for um, selling their plasma and then decide to donate their blood I, I actually think that's what's driving the small increase the small uptick in unpaid blood donations i think that's a function of like people who weren't going to sell their plasma looking at advertising for plasma and deciding to donate blood. The arguments of altruism and commodification are very intertwined, but the question of altruism can be summed up by asking, if you're paid to do something good, are you still doing something good with good intentions? Uh, we pay for all sorts of things like, um, you know, people are nurses, and so we pay people for uh, caring for other people. And so you might think, ah, well, this commodifies caring, but nobody thinks that. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody thinks that. Nobody thinks that it's wrong to pay nurses for what they do. No, we all think that like paying nurses is fine. We don't think that like nurses are uh, selfish or that like nurses don't engage in their um, nursing work without the right attitudes. No, we think that they're altruistic. Mm -hmm. So we think that like paying them is compatible with them having the right attitudes towards what they are doing, right? And same with teachers, I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. And am I commodified because I collect a salary for teaching you know, future generations or something like that? Absolutely not. We have life insurance that's compatible with having the right attitude um, towards other people. We pay for works of art. We know that like 
Picasso is worth 20 million or whatever the value of that painting is. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that like people who respect art don't have the right attitude towards the intrinsic value. It's perfectly compatible to do both. You can put out everything we buy has a price tag, but like, you know, right now I'm in my cabin in West Virginia mm -hmm. and, you know, I paid a certain amount of money for it, but it, but it's home. It's not just a house. It's, it's my home and home is like the place that makes you feel comfortable. And that's true, even though I paid money for it. So that the, the mood, the feeling that I have when I'm in this cabin, that's compatible with this cabin having a, a price tag. Right. right? Yeah. So at this point, I want to say, you know, we, we, we pay for plasma in the United States that, you know, people are paid for plasma. There are some states that don't have any, um, they don't have any paid plasma centers. Is there any evidence, right? We can ask people, we can take surveys, we can find out uh, about people's attitudes towards their own bodies or the, or human bodies in general. Is there any evidence that paying for plasma in a jurisdiction makes the people who live there feel differently about their own bodies or other people's bodies? The answer near as I can tell is no, right? So this is like a bit of speculation. And so I can speculate on the other side, for example. They're like, ah, if you put a price tag on this and people are going to think of that as a commodity, they're only going to care about it instrumentally, they're going to put the wrong value on it. But that's just speculate without empirical evidence that that's true. That's just pure speculation. But I can speculate on the other side. I can say, well, the danger of not allowing uh, paid plasma is that people are going to think that plasma is worthless, mm -hmm. right? Because if you attach a value of zero dollars to something, well, then you're communicating to others that it's utterly worthless. And so maybe people are going to have the wrong attitude towards their own body if we don't attach a price tag to it. No, of course, the argument that I just made is ridiculous. Yeah. Like you, clearly, everybody would say, wait, there's no evidence that that's true. But both arguments are on the same side. Neither of them have very much evidence going for them. So I don't, you know, I, I, I dismiss that concern. Exploitation introduces the question of, are we taking advantage of donors? On donationethics.com, we have a whole section that responds to the question of wrongful exploitation. And I don't think it's exploitative uh, at all. I mean, you're paying people $25 to $50 for a, um, for a donation that lasts anywhere between one and a half to two hours. That's actually a good deal. Right. And it represents about uh, 25 to 30 percent of the total revenue that the commercial enterprise receives from selling the, the plasma. So you're getting like a fair division. There's no particular there's no like significant risks to donating plasma. Um, you get paid more than the minimum wage, both in the U.S. and in Canada. So if if paying people for plasma is exploitative, then so is like a whole range of things that none of us think is exploitative, like uh, working at McDonald's or, you know, or, or any kinds of jobs that people might take that pay a little bit less than the minimum wage. People raise the worry about exploitation, but I don't understand how you don't solve the problem of exploitation by saying you can't do this. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not as though it's not as though the people who, you know, suppose it's poor people who sell their plasma and and, you know, we look at that and we go, oh, no, you know, that that's bad. But when you ban paid plasma, you don't magically put fifty dollars into the pockets of of like poor people. You don't address the issue of poverty at all. All you do is remove an option that like people who have very few options have. So if I, if I were a, a poor person, you know, selling my plasma might be at the top of my list of ways to like make ends meet or to help me make ends meet. That might be like the thing that I think is my best option. And then you come along, you, you know, you're like heroic supporter of the poor or whatever. And you're like, oh, dear poor people, I will help you. I will make it illegal for you to sell your plasma. I don't see how you've helped me at all. Right. All you've done is taken away the best option that I had to make ends meet. And now I have to go down further of my, my list of like bad options. And on this topic, RFN Studios producer and philosophy major John Harris wanted to dig into the philosophy of this argument. OK, so uh, so the characters that you mentioned, let's do a little brief political philosophy history. So, yeah, I mentioned Locke and then the, 
the contemporary like equivalent of Locke is going to be Robert Nozick. And Robert Nozick is responding to John Rawls. John Rawls is like the most significant political philosopher of the 20th uh, century, right? And Rawls in the theory of justice says, as it, as you put it, right? It's, it's okay to have inequalities, but only if they were down to the worst off like representative person or to the worst off group. So that's Rawls's view. Uh, Nozick is responding to Rawls in a Lockean vein. Uh, Nozick is saying that like we own ourselves and actually inequality isn't the thing that matters. What matters more is something like liberty. Uh, you have Sandel who is also responding to Rawls. He's, uh, he's a bit of a communitarian. He's a little bit more sympathetic to Rawls than Robert Nozick was. Elizabeth Anderson, more contemporarily, is talking about democratic equality. Uh, and then you mentioned G.A. Cohen, who's, who's fun to mention because he's Canadian um, and he's like a contemporary Marxist. So on the question of exploitation and each of these like figures in political philosophy, for somebody like Robert Nozick, that issue isn't going to come up uh, very strongly precisely because uh, for him, uh, people are going to have certain rights and they're going to have the right to make decisions about themselves. And, uh, you know, preventing people from selling their plasma, for example, is a form of paternalism that's going to conflict with, with his view about what it is just for us to do. This is going to be more of a live issue for somebody like Elizabeth Anderson and definitely somebody like Michael Sandel. Right. In my book, Markets Without Limits, and part of what we're doing is we're responding to people like Elizabeth Anderson uh, and and Michael Sandel. Um, broadly speaking, I think the I, th I don't think the issue of exploitation really applies in the case of paid plasma, given how much people are paid. So typically, theories of exploitation are going to give some kind of accounting of when, of when it is that we know that something is exploitative. And there are a number of different theories of exploitation. The most popular one is that there's like an unfair division of the benefits from trade. So like if you and I, John, if we engage in some kind of trade and I get like 90% of the value and you get 10% of the value, then we, we might say that I am exploiting you, right? I'm taking advantage of some vulnerability that you have in order to extract more than like my, than a fair, than a fair value of that particular exchange. Under that definition, wouldn't the donation be more exploitative than receiving some sort of compensation? <laughs> If it's exploitative to pay people $30 for plasma donation, if that's an unfair division of the benefits from trade, then like $0 is even worse. In terms of like an unfair division of the benefits from trade, I don't see it there in terms of like the risk to the donor. Cause sometimes you might say that like, you know, the risks are so high that the donor deserves or warrants like e even more, but the risk of plasma donation is not that significant. Um, and in terms of the like undue pressure, it's not a, like the amount of money that you're offered, it's significant. Like I said, it's like $300 a month and depending on um, how you're doing financially, that can be a significant sum of money, but it, it's not so much that you can't make a rational or reasonable decision to engage in this kind of exchange. So I actually don't think that any of the characters that you mentioned, I don't think, I don't think any of them when confronted with the facts of plasma donation, I don't think any of them would defend the view um, that paid plasma is exploitative. The only one, the only two that might are people like Elizabeth Anderson and uh, Michael Sandel. Right? With Peter being so devoted to this cause, I asked his feelings about the organizations like Blood Watch, who lobbied for the Voluntary Blood Donation Act in the first place, citing the tainted blood scandal. I think I think their heart is in the right place for the most part. I think their heart is in the right place. I've been very public and I've, you know, on Twitter and in other public venues and in fact in every every opportunity that I have, I tell groups like Bloodwatch but also other groups as well who are on the other side that it is irresponsible to raise the 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 prospect of of the tainted blood scandal. It's irresponsible. Frankly, I think it's um you know, I think it's unethical because at this point they should know better, right? They should know that paid plasma is not, does not represent, you know, a safety threat. I would, you know, I wish I could speak to them face to face in person and explain to them that this is, you know, this is behavior that's, 
it's simply unacceptable. We can have a very reasonable debate about the merits and demerits of compensating people for plasma donation without anybody being unscientific, um, uh, unscientific about it, right? Speaking more broadly, like the origin of Blood Watch, Blood Watch was founded um, by uh, or with the support of the Ontario Public Service Employees Union. And there's a complicated issue here because in the United States, there is no movement against paying people for plasma donations. And I think part of the reason why there is such a movement in Canada and there isn't one in the United States is because the people who are employed to collect blood and plasma in Canada uh, in Canadian blood services, they are all members of a public employee union, right? Mm -hmm. And commercial enterprises, they don't have to hire, you know, they don't have to hire anyone from the Ontario Public Service Employees Union or the equivalents in Alberta or British Columbia. They're not required by law to do that. So in Canada, what you have is like, you have this interest this employees union interest and you have commercial enterprises popping up that don't have to hire those people. So in Canada, it's the case that like if we ban commercial enterprises, then our only option is to expand Canadian blood services to collect plasma. And if we expand Canadian blood services to collect plasma, then the phlebotomists and everyone else who works there is gonna be um, represented by these public sector unions. So I think they have an interest in, in banning commercial enterprises uh, in order to increase the amount of clout that they have, in order to increase uh, the number of people that they represent, in order to increase the number of union dues, and so on. And, but I've asked Bloodwatch multiple times, like, where do you get your funding? And I know I found online, you know, I know that they've received almost at least, um, you know, almost $100,000 from public sector unions in um in Canada. So when the attempt was made to introduce the Voluntary Blood Donations Act on a federal level, nine patient groups united by the network of rare blood disorder organizations stood up and wrote a formal submission against the Voluntary Blood Donation Act, citing the fact that, quote, every year demand for plasma for immune globulin is rising faster than the plasma supply from non-compensated Canadian donors, end quote. And also stated, we see no evidence to suggest that the establishment of such plasma centers will have a negative impact on Canadian blood services and Hema-Quebec's capacity to continue to supply Canadians with labile products, red cells, platelets, and plasma for transfusion. Patients who require plasma-derived medicinal products see no merit to the argument that compensation of Canadian donors is unethical, while Canada and indeed the entire world rely on paid donors, mainly in the U.S., for the essential raw material needed to produce these life-saving medicines. Thankfully, the federal government listened to these patient voices. But unfortunately, the same cannot be said of the provincial governments of Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia during the time that the Voluntary Blood Donations Act was passed at the provincial level. I actually think that the lack of listening to patients is maybe the most significant issue with respect to the public policy discussion. I find it completely, frankly, shocking that like patient groups who have the, who stand to either gain the most or lose the most in this debate, mm -hmm. they're, they're off in the corner. No one's paying attention to the patient groups. So apart from the British Columbia Hemophilia Society, all of the other patient groups, all of them, are against banning paid plasma. And I think that speaks volumes, right? So these are the people that are reliant on the plasma medicine. If there was a safety concern, you better believe that those patient groups would be up in arms and yet they are not, right? If there was reason to believe that like unpaid plasma would result in collecting enough plasma, then you better believe that the, that the patient groups would say something to that effect and yet they haven't. I mean, obviously, 
Blood Watch, who is opposed to paid plasma, they're going to do the best they can to marginalize the voices of patients and to ignore the voices of patients and in public settings to kind of not talk about patients as much as possible. Because if they were to, to discuss patients, they would have to explain why they have a, a view that differs so much with patient groups. But I don't know why the major newspapers and the major media organizations in Canada have ignored the voices of patients. And I don't just say this as like, this is my impression. I've now collected in excess of 600 individual articles on the topic of, of uh, paid plasma in Canada. And, I've, and I'm going through the process of like identifying which of these articles speak about what particular uh, issues for a potential publication in the future. And I find that like consistently patient groups don't get cited, but blood watch is cited almost every single time. So whenever they're discussing whether or not they should ban plasma donations or when, whenever they're discussing these issues, these newspapers and these outlets, they almost invariably reach out to and speak to somebody from blood watch. It's usually Cat Lamb Payne, mm -hmm. right? But they do not also reach out to uh, the various patient groups in Canada or speak to patients like yourself. I understand why Blood Watch doesn't want the voices of patient groups to be, you know, loud in this debate. But what I don't understand is why the media in Canada doesn't, you know, reach out to patient groups as often as I, in my judgment, they should. This has improved slightly in Alberta since UCP MLA Tani Yao introduced Bill 204, the Voluntary Blood Donations Repeal Act, and I cannot thank him enough. But please, in the best interest of patients, recognize that this is not a partisan issue. Patients will rely on plasma therapies no matter what political party is in power. Another important player in the paid plasma debate is Canadian Blood Services. I have every reason to believe that Canadian Blood Services is doing, I think, the best that they can. I think it's really interesting that like back in 2014, when this debate was raging in Ontario, the official position of like Canadian Blood Services was neutral. Mm -hmm. And Graham Schur himself was kind of like, I don't know why people are opposed to paying people for plasma donations. So he, he put together an opinion piece, I think it was in the Toronto Star, it could have been the Globe and Mail, I don't remember, where he said, I mean, the title of it was something like, you know, banning paid plasma is going to negatively affect patients. So he sort of flipped and so did the position of Canadian Blood Services back in 2014 and 2015. You know, they were, they, they seemed to be supportive of paying people for plasma. And the reason why they were supportive, by the way, is because not paying people for plasma is not an effective way of collecting enough plasma to meet the demand um, in Canada in a way that's like financially responsible. But it is much more expensive to ask people to donate plasma for free than it is to give them $50 or $30 or whatever, right? And it's more expensive because you have to spend more on advertising and getting people through the door. So I think Canadian Blood Services understands that. I think what they weren't anticipating and what they weren't prepared for was the backlash from Blood Watch, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, the, the various nurses unions, and so on. Um, they were very politically astute. They attended the board meetings, Cat Lantain attended a number of them. I think a lot of pressure was put to bear on Canadian Blood Services. In terms of them as an organization, I have nothing but, uh, but respect for Canadian Blood Services. But looking into the future, I just don't see us getting enough plasma without paying for it. Canadian Blood Services does very important work, and I appreciate that plasma is only one of their many responsibilities. As much as I cannot say that I'm satisfied with the responses I've received or their costly, time-consuming project with the 40 plasma collection centers or their goal of only 50% self-sufficiency and their refusal to pay donors... I do want to see them succeed and work together with the private sector to give patients the best of both worlds. Patients do not have the luxury of time. We cannot waste time and money exhausting every other option when the answer is right in front of us. So first, I think the, I think the U.S. model, you know, it's, 
it's really good, right? So, and the reason why I say that is because just at the moment, 74% of the entire world, um, of the entire world's supply need is met by um, U.S. paid plasma centers. That's a, that's a really that's a really huge number. 74% of the entire world's like plasma medicine is made with um, the plasma from American paid donors. It represents, by the way, I, I was reading the, uh, the Economist on this issue. They say that 1.6% of total exports by GDP from the United States is plasma, right? 1.6%. That's enormous right that's more than like aluminum and steel exports combined and i think the american plasma centers are regulated very well uh, canada could have its own system that's true uh, but i think the the regulatory environment is sufficient in in, in the u.s and um and if we were to have more plasma centers in canada that would come with significant benefits we could also like know more uh, our, our regulatory bodies could know a bit more about the plasma that's coming in and out. And I just think it would be better if we allowed commercial enterprises to enter Canada and to open these plasma centers there. The economic benefits are significant. And it's worth pointing out, I mean, we're, we're paying for plasma in Canada. We just happen to be paying Americans for their plasma. Right? That's, that's the weird thing in this debate. We're a bunch of hypocrites. Really? I can put that so starkly. Like Ontario banned paid plasma in 2014. Guess what? Right now, Ontario uses more paid plasma than they did before the passage of the Voluntary Blood Donations Act. The same is true in Alberta, which banned it in 2017, and in British Columbia, which banned it in 2018. We're using more paid plasma. If anybody, like, yeah, we passed a law that says we banned paid plasma. No, no, we didn't ban paid, paid plasma. Sorry, mm -hmm. we banned paying Canadians for plasma. We didn't ban paying Americans for plasma, and that's what we're doing. Why are we preferring to pay Americans for their plasma than paying like Canadians for their plasma? When Ontario banned paying Canadians for, for their plasma, Canadian Plasma Resources had a plan with, which included like $100 million of investment into the Ontario economy. And they had to leave, right? They were going to open three centers and they were also in the process of, uh, of talking with, I think it was a German company, to open a fractionation facility. Fractionation facilities are the, you know, the things that take the raw plasma and convert them into the various plasma medicines. Mm -hmm. You know, it costs almost a billion, a billion with a B to open a fractionation facility. All of that money could go into the economy of like Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia. We need an effective solution. And if that means exploring other options, we need to jumpstart that conversation. Canadian Blood Services is exempt from the Voluntary Blood Donations Act. And so perhaps other forms of remuneration could be proposed. Uh, Blood Watch and other groups like to point to countries like Italy as examples of countries that get a lot of plasma donation without paying people for it. And I actually think that like Italy is a bad example of that because Italy will give you a paid day off work to donate either blood or plasma. And a lot of people prefer to donate blood in Italy than plasma because it doesn't take as long uh, to donate blood as it does to donate plasma, but you can donate plasma more frequently. You can do it once a week in Europe or twice a week in Canada and in the United States, right? But like a paid day off work, how does that not count as payment? Right? That's clearly payment, right? So like Italy is another one of the countries that like pays people for both plasma and blood donation. We just have this weird like technical system where we don't call that proper compensation. Um, giving people a paid day off work in Canada might work. I think that might be an alternative to giving people cash money, right? Um, I don't know why we're allergic to paying people cash. We don't give nurses a, a paid day off their other jobs, right? We don't come up with these like weird schemes to like pay nurses, doctors, and teachers. No, we just give them cash money, right? So give people a tax credit, that's something. But yeah, if we don't repeal the Voluntary Blood Donations Act, which would be really sad and I hope that we do, I hope that Ontario and Alberta and British Columbia and, and even Quebec, I hope that they do repeal it. 
Um, if we don't repeal it, I believe that we will continue to be reliant on the United States and other jurisdictions that pay for um, plasma donations. I know that the Netherlands, St. Keen, is their um, blood collecting body. I know St. Keen is putting thought into paying people for plasma donations. And given the nature of the demand, there will be countries that are going to go ahead and pay for plasma. And um, and I think we'll just be more reliant on other countries. One glaring question that I had was why, when the U.S. is the largest collector of plasma, were American patients affected more severely and for longer than Canadian patients? I'm not entirely sure why that's the case. Um, I mean, and in a way, um, it's a little bit more upsetting, right? Because mm -hmm. the the plasma comes from the United States, uh, and meanwhile, like patients in the United States are suffering from IVIG shortages, um, SCIG shortages. So it takes like seven to twelve months to make a single vial of immune globulin. Right. Right. So. So that supply chain is complicated. That means the plasma that we collect today won't be turned into a medicine until like at least seven months from now. So we have to, we have to anticipate. And all of these companies, they have, they're contractually obligated to fulfill certain kinds of demands, right? So like Canadian Blood Services signs a contract with Griffles and with Takeda. I think those are the only two companies, but it could be others. And then Griffles and Takeda are contractually obligated to produce enough medicine for Canadian blood services. In the United States, the various hospitals, and sometimes I think groups of hospitals, create these contracts as well. But, you know, Canadian blood services is bigger. Right. Um, Canadian blood services is all of Canada. So that's a huge contract. So a company like Takeda is probably going to prioritize a, a contract from Canadian Blood Services over a contract from like a, a hospital in, you know, Morgantown, West Virginia. This is yet another reason why Canada needs to step up when it comes to aiming to contribute to the global supply. It is hugely unfair for us to put this burden almost exclusively on the backs of a handful of countries, be one of the largest drains on that supply, and then pat ourselves on the back for our perceived moral superiority for having a purely voluntary unpaid donation system. This is not only hypocritical, it is harmful. In conclusion, I, I do, for anyone who's listening, I hope I hope that you're willing to do something to, to kind of repeal the Voluntary Blood Donations Act. This is an issue that's going to affect us for many years into the future. Right? The demand for these products is growing significantly, and there are plenty of countries who are just now coming online, like whole, whole parts of India. We're talking about like millions and millions of people do not have access to these medicines. Right? And, and the, those healthcare systems are slowly improving. And when they come online, the demand for these medicines is going to grow. Right now, it's growing at 9.6%. But that's a stable growth, meaning that like, we'll see higher, higher growth rates in the demand for these medicines going forward into the future. And, and oh, by the way, if it turns out that human blood plasma is good at addressing like Alzheimer's, dementia, or uh, something to do with cardiovascular events, then that demand is going to, it's not just going to skyrocket, it's going to blow up, it's going to be so significant. And the thought that like right now, by passing these laws, all we're doing is we're limiting the amount of plasma that we're collecting in Canada, and I think that's a mistake. So I would urge listeners to do something, to pick up the phone, call your local MP, call your local MPP, actually never mind the MP, just your local MPP, right? Uh, Call that person and ask him or her to like repeal the Voluntary Blood Donations Act. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time, your enthusiasm, and your advocacy. It is so greatly appreciated. If you'd like to learn more, check out donationethics.com, follow Peter Jaworski on Twitter, and if you'd like to help but need some guidance on where to start or have any questions, feel free to contact me directly at kate at plasmaforlife.org. Please consider donating blood or plasma wherever you are. 
paid or unpaid, it is one of the greatest contributions you can make to help patients, and we thank all donors for taking the time. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll stay tuned for our next interview in this Plasma for Life podcast series.